Good morning. It's a pleasure to be uh, chairing uh, today's session, the last of the three days. The uh, first speaker is Stas Smirnov, who splits his time between Geneva and Moscow. Uh, he's an expert in complex analysis, probability, and mathematical physics, and I think he'll regale us of a combination of all three of those. Uh, he won a Clay Research Award in 2001, and then a Fields Medal in 2010. Uh, and he's well known for many results, including the proof of the conformal invariance of the limit of percolation and the easing model in 2D. So, Stas. Thank you, Ivan. Very nice to be here, and I definitely, well, admire the Clay family and the Clay Institute for doing so many nice things. And uh, well, obviously, they did some nice things at the beginning of my career. Uh, and uh, uh, I thought that it's it's appropriate, so I, I got Clay Prize for what I want to mention for proving conformal invariance of percolation on triangular lattice. And what happened uh, a year ago that with a graduate student we found a much more conceptual and much easier proof. And it's actually good that we found it now and not back then, because with such an easy proof, they would have never given me the prize. <laughs> so I, I'll try to tell uh, about this proof. But first, I should sort of uh, uh, give an introductory colloquium tie style talk. And then there will be a complete proof, which just has three lemmas in it. Uh, and uh, I should say what is percolation. So as I said, this is a joint work. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, Misha Christoforov. So it's uh, so percolation is uh, one of the easiest models of statistical mechanics. So the most ubiquitous one is the easing model, which is model of ferromagnet. Uh, and it's uh, basically you have spins of two colors, and they interact usually nearest neighbor in there, and they uh, sort of try to align with some force. And depending on this force, it turns out that either you can have magnetization or you can have uh, chaos. Uh, and that model was introduced in the 20s by the advisor of uh, easing uh, lens. Uh, but percolation apparently was introduced much earlier, accidentally, in the first volume of American Mathematical Monthly. Uh, and they posed a problem, which I'm now going to discuss, and then gave a wrong solution. And then there is an editor's note, so it's 1891. Something seems to be wrong with this solution. If someone finds the correct one, please send it to our journal. Uh, so it's 1891. And um, the problem is like that. So what, what I say, it's, it's a simplified version of percolation. It's called Bernoulli percolation. Uh, so uh, let's fix a graph. So it's fix a graph. So for example, it can be a piece of a square lattice. So you think that this is a map of a city. And for example, uh, some of the streets are closed due to, I don't know, some repair work. Uh, and uh, well, let's say these streets are closed. And then you're asking a question whether one can drive, say, from the northern boundary to the south. So is there a way avoiding the closed streets which goes through. And then you think that the city is random. So basically, you say the following, that each, each edge is open with probability equal to p, closed with probability equal 1 minus p independently. And then what you ask is, uh, what is the uh, probability that there is a connection from top to bottom of open streets? Uh, so uh, uh, immediately you see that there is a parameter p. So this probability obviously changes when parameter p changes. So the question they asked in American Mathematical Monthly is to understand how this behaves for a large enough box. Uh, and uh, well, immediately what you see that if you study a finite size city, like here, five by five, so there are a total of uh, like about 40 edges here. So whatever event you can write, it will be polynomial in P of degree at most 40. Because every configuration I draw, it has probability, which is some 
monomial in P and 1 minus P. So you sum these monomials for the required configuration. So it's uh, obviously, well, probability depends on P. Obviously, it will be some function which is increasing. It's also not very hard to see that if you open more streets, then uh, the probability that you can get through increases. To prove it rigorously, you need to do some coupling between P and P plus epsilon, but it's, it's, not, it's a fairly easy exercise to do that. So what you can do, uh, you can draw a graph. So let's say you draw a graph. So this is P, which varies between 0 and 1. Uh, and let's say here we put probability of a crossing. And again, it varies between 0 and 1. And immediately, you see that it's, it's increasing. It's some polynomial, some smooth function. Now, uh, the question which you ask, so it was originally posed as a problem in statistical physics. And the question was that you have some porous medium where the water can seep through, or a gas can seep through. So they were asking uh, questions about filters in gas masks. And uh, uh, in that case, uh, the scale at which uh, you have the streets and which you observe the events are very different. So you study not, uh, say, 5 by 5 rectangle, but 100 by 100, 1,000 by 1,000 or bigger. Or in mathematics terms, you can fix the size of the rectangle and send the mesh of the lattice to 0. So the question is, what happens when mesh to the lattice is very small? So it's like 1,000 by 1,000. So it's obviously increasing. It's obviously smooth. But the degree of polynomial gets larger and larger. And as we know by Weierstrass theorem, that any smooth function, for example, can be approximated by polynomials or even to some extent discontinuous functions. So what happens is that uh, uh, if, if the mesh of, so you start with some graph which goes something like that, but as the mesh of the lattice increases, the graph gets more and more like this. So it's, it's some sort of a jump phenomenon. And it turns out that there is a critical value of P so that in the limit what you have as the mesh of the lattice tends to zero. So in, let's maybe use some other color blue. So blue color is uh, when the step of the lattice, the size of the box tends to infinity or step of the lattice equivalently tends to zero. You get a function which is zero up to some number. Then it has some non-trivial value, which depends on what kind of shape you consider. And then it's equal to one. Uh, and uh, 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 if you are a mathematician, of course, what you can do, you can, instead of uh, looking at bigger and bigger boxes, you can start looking at an infinite city. And you start at the center, say you start at the whatever Times Square or Piccadilly Circus, and you ask whether you can escape the city and run away to infinity. So it's a different uh, way to formulate this problem. So it's denoted you know, theta of p. So it's basically a probability in P that zero is connected to infinity. So it's a probability that, uh, well, you get infinite city and you can escape from the center. Now, um, mm, again, it's between zero and one. Uh, and again, uh, as here, it's sort of clear that when P is equal one, everything is open, you can connect. Here it's also clear that when uh, P is equal to one, you can escape to infinity because everything is open. It's clear when p equals 0 that uh, everything is closed, you cannot escape. Uh, so what turns out to be true that here it's a similar behavior that there is some number pc, let's say pc prime, and then uh, it doesn't get to 1, obviously, because always if p, for example, is equal to 0.9, there is always a positive probability that your neighbors are closed. So whenever we are here, it's still there is a probability smaller than 1, then we can escape because it might be that Everything is open, but your immediate neighborhood is closed. But it's again increasing and going to that. Now, what I formulated here, it's already a non-trivial theorem, and people uh, got much acclaim about this, so I'll just mention some names. So it started with a, uh, so let's say, in two dimensions. Uh, it started with Russa, Seymour, and Welsh. And then there were many other people Eisenman and uh, Barsky and Menshikov and Grimmett and most notably Harry Keston and one can continue. So for example, the theorem that the picture looks like that and the picture looks like this and that this function is continuous at this point, it's very non-trivial theorem. And uh, the original proof, if you look in Grimmett's books, for example, it takes 
uh, pro prove that it goes like that and it's continuous. It takes two pages and more than, ha more than 100 pages and uh, two chapters. So recently we were able to reduce some, some of it too much. Uh, 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 so there are newer things by myself and Hugo Diminu and Juan uh, Santacion where these theorems actually were looked upon in a very new light and now the proofs of this are about like less than 10 pages long and more conceptual but that it would have never arrived without those people doing it in 70s and 80s. Now, um, so this is for R2 and a small just remark that three-dimensional lattices it's very, very, very wide open. So it's, it's surprising but if you pose the same problem in R3 people don't know where to start. So, for example, it's clear that this function is increasing, but the fact that it doesn't have a jump at this point is wide open. It's one of the big problems in probability. And in R2, we'll see one of the building blocks of the proof later. It's some sort of planar duality. So this was the state of uh, the subject in probability, uh, but what I'm speaking about is more about the physics development, because suddenly in in the 80s, uh, conformal field theory came along, and with it came some uh, really spectacular predictions about how this phase transition occurs. So before that, I, I want to say a few words about this phase transition. Yeah, by the way, one of the themes that these two PCs are the same. Uh, so uh, uh, if you look at the real world, for example, if you look at the ferromagnetic phase transition in some metals, uh, uh, you will see that the critical temperature PC here is different. But the way the phase transition occurs is the same. So for example, the function like this for like uh, iron or some alloys will jump at a different temperature, say 1042 Kelvin grade for iron and it would be like uh, uh, 100 uh, Celsius for niobium alloys. But uh, you, ca you have um, exactly the same power law here, fractional power law here. So here it's the similar thing that uh, if I take different lattice from the one I pictured, Phenomenon will be the same, but PC will be different. So a short remark is that uh, uh, PC depends on the lattice. And a few examples, so if you take a square lattice uh, and you take, uh, let's say, triangular lattice, uh, yeah, uh, And then you can do percolation of edges. So this is usually called bond percolation. But you can also do uh, side percolation when you uh, declare open or closed, not the streets, but rather the intersections. So it's slightly different model. So bond uh, stands for edge, but also there is a side percolation. Uh, so PC, for example, is equal for to one half when you do side for triangular lattice and bond for square. Uh, and bond for square, well, maybe, well, we'll see in a second why it is one half for a different model. We'll see it for this one. But it's some sort of duality between the model and uh, the model on a dual lattice. Now, if you take uh, bond percolation triangular lattice, then it's twice sine of pi over 18. Now you might ask a question how, how on earth one gets this number. And what turns out that here the model is self-dual, so you can uh, play with this model of uh, roots in square lattice, but you can may play with the model of abstractions in dual square lattice. And it's also square lattice. But if you uh, start with roots on triangular lattice, the abstractions would be on hexagonal lattice, which is dual to triangular, and not the same. But they can be related by star triangle transformation, one of these sort of young Baxter tricks. And that gives a cubic relation, and it turns out that there the fixed point is, is this number. On the other hand, there are some, uh, 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 so this is very much not like in physics. In physics, all the critical, all the Curie temperatures are some transcendental numbers you cannot deduce from the basic laws with some precision. And this is what happens for site percolation square lattice. This is something probably transcendental, approximately 0, 0.58, et cetera. So uh, PC depends on the lattice, but other things are universal. So what are other things? And here I'll mention a few predictions. So it's basically conformal field theory predictions. 
Uh, so this is, uh, uh, well, actually people got to these predictions before conformal field theory came around. So they got first by assuming that percolation in some way is related to Gaussian free field, which is conformally invariant. Uh, and uh, there were spectacular ones, for example, that theta of p, when p is approximately equal pc plus something, behaves like p minus pc to the power 5 over 36. Uh, so uh, when you first see this, again, it's, it doesn't usually happen in real life physics. So in real life uh, physics, all the exponents you have, you get uh, some fractional exponents because of the renormalization group, but usually they are some transcendental numbers, non-integers. Uh, but here it's a non-trivial problem in the plane and suddenly out of the blue you get 5 over 36. So maybe here a short remark how you get these numbers in conformal field theory. So there you get some, as some weights in some algebraic representations of some of certain objects, which, uh, and this part is completely rigorous. But then why this object should be related to some lattice model, that, that was a bit uh, of a stretch of leap of faith in physics literature. So that was what mathematicians were struggling to understand. And uh, maybe if uh, I do, so what kind of my other favorite prediction. So for example, um, Hausdorff dimension, uh, when you take PC percolation of a crossing. So by the way, here it's sort of, uh, a thing which you very much see in nature. So if you have a forest fire spreading or an epidemic spreading, so for example, for epidemics, this is like how contagious is the virus, how likely it is to spread to your neighbor. For forest fire, how dry is the wood, how likely is the fire spread. So there is a subcritical and then you cannot pass through, the fire doesn't spread. There is supercritical, then in summer everything burns down. And then there is a critical which is very hard to zoom into because it's, it's just one point where the fire stops somewhere in the middle at a fractal curve. But the interesting thing is that in real life you see these fractal curves. And the reason is that uh, if you have a normal patch of wood, it won't have a fixed uh, value of P throughout. Somewhere P will be bigger, somewhere P will be smaller, and the places where P is bigger, they will burn down completely. The places where P is small, there the fire doesn't spread. So it stops exactly in the, between the pieces where P is supercritical and subcritical. So where P is approximately equal PC, so you see this behavior. So it's, it's actually interesting, but you observe it in nature. And for example, you observe it, it was first observed with nature with forest fires, with aerial pictures, that Hausdorff dimension of a boundary of a fire, or the same of percolation crossing, like, like the one I pictured there, is equal to four thirds. Uh, so what that means for a finite box? For a finite box, it means that uh, essentially, if uh, in N by N box, uh, number of uh, uh, steps in a crossing is approximately equal to n to the power of four thirds, which means that the crossing is a fractal. So if you have thousand by thousand box, then to cross it you need thousand to the power of four thirds, thousand to the power of four thirds, it's ten thousand, so it's ten times long, so it will be rather a wiggly path. Uh, and this looks like a fairly tame number, but for example, Hausdorff dimension uh, of uh, the whole area which is burned, so of a cluster. If you start a fire in a square and you look all the, or you take a point in the city and you look at all the intersections you can reach, then the dimension will be 91 over 48. So uh, those were quite shocking things when I first saw them and for most mathematicians as well. And we're struggling to understand what physicists were doing and trying to translate it into our language and making, make it rigorous. And then there was another prediction which was made by Cardi and uh, uh, eventually this, that was what we were able to prove. So this is uh, uh, the following, what is, what's called Cardi formula. So you ask a question, what is the probability at PC to be able to cross some shape? So you take some shape and you ask what is the probability to be able to cross? Now, as I said, uh, this probability, of course, uh, is some polynomial in P, and in PC it gets you some value, but let's uh, look at it when the mesh of the lattice is almost zero. So we, instead of this, we, we take limit of this as mesh of the lattice goes to zero. And then uh, uh, there was a very influential numerical paper by Langlands, Robert Langlands, and uh, Puyot and Santobon. So what uh, they not proved, but conjectured 
with the help of uh, Michael Eisenman, uh, that uh, this number, so that this, uh, I this exists, this number is universal, so it's independent of the lattice, and it's conformally invariant. And if it's conformally invariant, it means that it just depends on conformal models of a rectangle. And uh, any topological rectangle you can send by a conformal map to a real rectangle, and then the models is just the ratio of the sides. Or you can send it to, for example, disk, you have four points on the boundary, you can send three of them to whatever, minus one, one, and i, and the position of fourth point again parameterizes the models. So the uh, parameterization they took uh, was uh, that you send three points to zero, uh, one, and infinity, and the third point to m, and then you ask what is the probability that you can join these two arcs. And if you get an, uh, an answer for that, or rather it's the limit of probability to be strict, then you get answer for any domain because any domain can be normalized to half plane. And the answer was, was a rather interesting thing, so it's a gamma, well, there are, it's a hypergeometric function. And then uh, to normalize it, because you have a probability when m slides around, it should change between 0 and 1, so it's normalized by gamma functions in so, such a way that it changes between, uh, between 0 and 1. Now, uh, that uh, already is something uh, which looks less intimidating than number four thirds. Well, maybe certainly less intimidating to complex analysts because uh, when a uh, complex analyst sees uh, this thing, he sees schwarz christoffel mapping uh, to, to a triangle. And the angles of triangle, or rather slopes of the lines, they are given by one third, two thirds, and four thirds of the full angle. And the first person to observe this was Leonard Carlson because he's well, the best complex analyst alive. Uh, and if you formulate it in that way, it becomes a really uh, beautiful theorem, so limit of the probability. So now we normalize in a different way. We take a, well, equilateral triangle, and we fix three points. So we send every, ma every domain can be mapped to a disk. Every disk, well, disk can be mapped to equilateral triangle, and uh, three points we can send to the sides, and then there is somewhere the, uh, let's say, the fourth point. So we studied the question if this length is L, the side is 1, for example, what is the uh, probability, limit of probability to have this connection? And it turns out that uh, uh, this formula gives exactly the map of half plane to equilateral triangle, so this probability is exactly L. And then, of course, it becomes a much simpler thing, and uh, uh, many people went into this subject, including, for example, Dead Schramm and myself, because that looked like a problem which might be easy to solve. So probability to land on an arc of, uh, on an interval of length L is exactly equal to L. And, uh, of course, this suggests uh, to try to do it not on square lattice, but on hexagonal lattice or triangular lattice. In the hint side, it turned out to be a red herring. So it's, uh, you get 60 degrees here because percolation has uh, central charge zero and it's related to 60, well, third root of unity. But uh, uh, so far, still the proof only worked for triangular lattice. Now, uh, I want to say two words how Cardi proved this. So what Cardi did, he moved this point, or rather this point, on this interval. And uh, he observed that not only this probability has some physical meaning, which is obvious, but also its derivative has a different physical meaning. And this two physical meaning, by some hand waving, uh, or a rigorous physical argument, as, as physicists say, can be related to each other. And essentially, you get for this quantity as a function of m, you get a Riccati type equation, like f prime is equal to f squared, this type of thing. And essentially, well, that's the simplest equation where you don't have an algebraic solution. You can try it as sines, cosines, or logarithms or something. And this is the solution. And uh, so basically, Cardi's proof wasn't intimidating. He just got an equation f prime equal to f squared, well, with some coefficient. And this is the solution. Now, uh, what uh, we 
tried to do. Instead, uh, we tried, being complex analysts, uh, what we tried to do, so Cardi was essentially doing this, he was moving point around, and us being complex analysts, we tried uh, to move this point inside. So we put the point inside and tried to move it around inside and tried to redefine this number so it's defined not only on the boundary but also inside, inside the thing. And essentially, mm, if you move it on the side, you were studying the, this connection, probability. So what we were studying was the probability of this connection. Now, uh, as I promised, I'm going to uh, tell of a, of a new proof. And um, I'll start by telling how we arrived at a new proof. So I will, I will tell you uh, why uh, we decided to look at what we decided to look. It's, so this part is not necessary for the proof. It's just some sort of motivation. And the first piece of motivation is that we rewrite a little bit the percolation model. So we do percolation model not on a square lattice. We do what is called a uh, uh, placket percolation on hex lattice. So it's the same by, by duality as the site percolation on triangular lattice. So covering sides on, triangle, sides on triangular lattice is the same as covering uh, hexagons on hexagonal lattice. And uh, here's an example of configuration of hexagonal lattice. Uh, so I, I've uh, covered hexagons blue and uh, red. Uh, uh, and essentially what I do here uh, for this lattice, it's known, as I said, PC is equal to one half. So I essentially, in the morning, I came very early and tossed a coin for every hexagon and covered it blue or red, depending on whether it came head, head or tails. Now, uh, uh, this is not like very important for percolation. That would have been important for the easing model where there is some interaction, is to put boundary conditions. So for this case, I just put all red boundary conditions. So for example, you can think that, uh, mm, let's say, on the boundary, this wood is burning. And in red places, there are trees which are prone to fire. So it spreads, and everything red burns from the boundary, except for this island, because it's not connected to the boundary. So this is, uh, well, an example of sort of real life problem, how, how you see percolation. So red percolates inside from all the sides. Now, what is the uh, partition function of this? So usually, <coughs> uh, people, uh, well, you can write it in two ways. You can say that partition function is is one, just to normalize it uh, immediately. Or you can say that each side is blue or red with weight one. Then there are two to the power area possible configurations, one for blue, one for red, and you take one plus one to the power area. So this is the number, the total number of configurations I can draw, two to the power area. And then uh, there is an observation that uh, what I can do, I can erase these covers. And I uh, only draw the interfaces or as physicists say, domain walls, which separate blue from red. And then I get this picture. Now, uh, there is a bijection. If I have this picture and I fix a cover of one hexagon, I can uniquely reconstruct that picture. Because I just start covering, so I cross a boundary, this is blue. Here I cross a boundary, it's red. I, oops. Well, I don't care, I'm colorblind, but OK, red, red, red. Red. Uh, so it's, it's very easy to cover if, if you have one reference point. And uh, here, uh, what we have is a bijection. So there is a percolation model on the left. And on the right is a loop model, where uh, weight of every loop configuration is 1. And what we just did, we proved the theorem that uh, partition function of two models coincide. So the number of loop configurations is exactly 2 to the power area. Uh, well, I fixed here the cover. Sorry. What? I, I, I fixed the cover of one thing. No, well, uh, let's, let's work out some example for those who are, yeah. So uh, how many ways to cover this guy are there? Either blue or red. And now, how many loop configurations you have there? Either this loop configuration or the configuration where there are no loops. Two is equal to two. Yeah, good. I always knew I can trust you. 
Yeah, okay, but no, but ob 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 obviously if you don't fix this cover, then, then there, is, there, there is a factor of two, yes. But it's, it's like, we would actually come to it in a second. Now, um, what this boundary conditions translate into? This boundary condition translate into the fact that no loops exit the, bow, exit the domain. Now, suppose we want to study this crossing probability. Now, if we have crossing probability, we have to distinguish four points in our quadrangle. And that we do here. And the way to distinguish them is to put boundary condition. If we study probability of a blue crossing, it makes sense to put O blue here, O blue there, and put O red here, O red there. And then suppose that we have this blue crossing and we want to see what does it mean in terms of these interfaces. Now, uh, now since I have boundary which is called red, blue, red, blue, there are four boundary points which are sources of the interfaces. So interface domain wall between blue and red starts here. And it can't end in the middle of a domain. It has to go on and on and on and end at one of these three points. And suppose that we have a blue crossing. Then it's forced to end at this one. So uh, suppose that I do some cover, uh, covering. For example, I cover it like that. Well, what would be a good thing, let's say. I cover it like this. And the rest is red. Then what happens is that, uh, uh, let's say, red, 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 red. Then I go and go and go and go with my interface. And because of this crossing, I am forced to land at this point. Well, there is also one more loop. And you can do the same thing with erasing the loops. So you can do the same thing and you get this loop, uh, uh, oops, uh, the loop model on the right. And then this will be connected in some sort of way also. So essentially the theorem we now proved that probability intercalation to connect to opposite sides in blue is equal to number of such configuration dividing by exponential of the area, which in the language of the loop model is the number of configuration where you have this uh, connection A to B, C to D, which is the probability in the loop model that there is this connection. And essentially what would be the dual thing? So the complementary thing is that the red thing goes sideways. And this is actually the, the reason why PC is equal to one half. So uh, if, if you are into mathematical games, there is a game of hex, which was quite, well reinvented by John Nash. And there is, a, I think, a cardboard copy in Princeton common room, uh, which he made. And it was invented by a Danish guy a year before, uh, which uh, consists of a hexagonal board. And two players, one puts blue hexagons, another red ones. And the first player wins if he has blue up-down connection, and the second wins if you have red horizontal. And you can have exactly, you will have at the end exactly one of these two. So the theorem that this game is well defined and there, is no, there are no draws and one person wins is exactly this. So it means in our language that either you have a blue up-down connection or red left-right obstruction. So these two probabilities, they sum to one. And uh, this actually implies with some work, uh, a lot of work Kirsten has shown us, that PC is equal to one half. Because uh, mm, blue model for value P is related to red model for value one minus P. And for something interesting to happen, the two values should coincide. So PC is equal one half because PC is a root of the equation P is equal to one minus P. And P equal to one minus P is solved by P equal one half. And this is the reason why you have this uh, twice sine pi over 18 for triangular uh, for the bonds on triangular edges because there you get a th degree three equation p cubed plus one is equal to thrice p and uh, there the solution is this sine function. And again, uh, well, there is a reformulation with the loop model is that uh, this to sum to one, then this to sum to one. Now, as I said, we want to move one of our points inside. So let's go and move one of our points inside. And uh, uh, what we do, we uh, mark three points on the boundary. So I denoted them A, A0, A1, and A2. 
And then uh, we look at point Z, which is, uh, so it turns out that it's good to take Z as a center of an edge. Uh, and we look, want to look at this probability. So our function H J of Z, so strictly speaking, we need also to put points A0, A1, A2 as indices here. It's probability that there is a curve which separates A G and Z from two other points. So now you can ask a question how you formulate it in terms of the loop model. And it turns out uh, that there is no uh, real bijection with something in the loop model, but uh, uh, which is one, one step. But there is a two-step thing. It's sort of related to what is called disorder operators. So look, uh, we had three points on the boundary, and they were sources of these curves. Now we have one point in the middle, so we should also make it a source of a curve. So essentially, we should consider configurations which uh, would look, let's say, something like that, and count how many of those we have. Now, uh, one can prove a theorem that actually number of configurations in percolation model such that there is a blue curve separating Z from AJ, Z and AJ from two other points, is the same as the number of configurations in loop model where you have three sources on the boundary, one inside, and this source inside is uh, connected to point AJ. So this is actually not very difficult. So uh, since we don't need it in the proof, this is just a motivation why we started looking at these pictures. And you can forget everything which was here before. For the proof, you need only look at the probability or other number of pictures like that. But the proof essentially goes like that, that you, you, take, uh, you, you take the leftmost blue crossing which exists. So you move it as far to the left as possible. So it, it would mean that you, you have something like, for example, this one, this picture. And then uh, what happens uh, if you start interface here, it's bound to bump into this curve. So it goes like that. So I let me redraw it. So I made a mistake of drawing it before I covered everything. So you draw the interface and it goes uh, something like that. Okay, now once we've drawn this interface and have this blue crossing, we can do whatever we like on the right, it doesn't change a thing. And how many different coverings of everything on the right are there? Two to the power area of what is left. Now suppose I'm playing with this picture. Suppose I've drawn this interface and I start drawing loops there. How many ways to draw the loops are there? Two to the power area. And since I have two sources here and here, they will forcefully be connected. No other way to connect them. Now, if you want really to do bijection with coverings, there is a trick. So we need to do a covering in such a way that uh, there is an interface which ends up here. So what we do, we draw some slit, and we say that uh, the covering, uh, has to change across the slit. So for example, uh, what it has to be, so if we cover it blue here and blue here, then in the middle of this hexagon, there is a kind of strange wall. When you pass it, uh, everything becomes negative of its own. So we can also, if you're a complex analyst, you can think that you live on the Riemann surface of square root of z, and there are two sheets which are negative of each other, something like that, and this one realization. But basically what you do, you take some covering, uh, and uh, then uh, mm. Mm, okay. uh, what do I have to do? No, 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 I did it wrong. Uh, so for example, Suppose I have this, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. No, I got it wrong. Wait a second. I got it wrong. Yeah, 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 I got it wrong. Oh, well. Never differentiate in public, yeah. Yeah, suppose that you have this covering. 
And so I do a covering of hexagonal lattice, so I toss a coin for each hexagon. But then there is a, this cross cut, so the hexagons which intersect this cross cut, I call cover two halves in two opposite covers. And then what happens with this picture, if I leave this point, I go and go and go and go and go and go, uh, and uh, oh, oh gosh. Yeah, so le let me first draw it, and then I see what do I need to have to arrive at this conclusion. Yeah, I need to have it blue here and red there, yeah. Yeah, of course. So basically, if I draw a picture uh, so that uh, every hexagon is blue or red, but then I do a cross cut, and for this cross cut I take hexagons half blue, half red, then uh, there will be a curve ending at Z. Because when you go around Z, you intersect this cross cut once, and blue becomes red. So there is exactly one curve ending at Z. So this is uh, the way you do bit bijection bit between these two pictures, but it's not universal. You have to fix, fix a cross cut. OK. But this is not quite, quite important, what, 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 what I said. So the important is this picture. And this is essentially definition of our function. So we have three functions which correspond to three different pictures. So let me maybe uh, row it down a little bit. So this is the definition. So h j of z is one, uh, well, two to the power minus area. And then the number of configurations which go like that. So there is this connection, and then there is this connection to z from the point a j. Now uh, j is equal to 0, 1, 2. So we have a domain with three boundary points, a0, a1, and a2. And we have point z inside. Now uh, let me formulate uh, three lemmas, which will give us the proof. And lemma one, mm, so we want uh, to prove that something is conformally invariant. And we have three functions, h1, h2, and h3. Uh, and of course, the sort of logical thing is to form some symmetric combination of those. And the easiest symmetric combination would be sum for j from 0 to 2 of hj of z. And it turns out that the sum is conformally invariant because it's identically equal to 1. And the proof is quite easier because uh, the proof tells us, uh, well, says the following. So suppose we cou count uh, the number, uh, well, which is 2 to the power area, is the number of all the pictures where you have three sources on the boundary and also uh, one source inside. Uh, so how, how you get this with covering? It, it's just, as, as I said, that you introduce a cross cut from this point, and then you do the coverings. But across this cross cut, you do blue-red. You flip when you, you, when you move through this imaginary wall. You flip from red to blue. So there are two to the power area coverings. But now assume that you have four sources. They should be connected in some way. Because when you start here, eventually you end somewhere. And what are the possible ways to connect? Well, uh, there are exactly three possible ways to connect, like that or like this or the third one, which exactly, if you divide by 2 to the power area, will give us uh, h0, h1, and h2. So their sum is identically equal to 1. Questions? Is it clear? So it's, I mean, the only difficult, is it, have I missed a factor of two? <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> it's, it reminds me of a talk by Nikita, <laughs> Nikita Nikrasov, and then I think, uh, what, who was that? Ed, Ed Witten asked a question, oh, Nikita, and what is this number pi in this formula? Nikita looked at it, looked, then checked the form. Oh, it's the length of a circle of diameter one. <laughs> uh, so, um, Let's say lemma two. Uh, now uh, we want to form another symmetric thing out of three functions. So what would be the what would be the coefficient so that it's symmetric? Any suggestions? Some symmetric sum of three functions. You have like rotational symmetry, 120 degrees. So what? Any suggestions? Finite. Sorry. It's finite. finite. Product. Uh, no, I want sum. Product, uh, 
product won't work because this function is actually a harmonic. Product of harmonic functions is not, uh, not any good. Uh, well, okay, so the, I need some, uh, something symmetric. So I define a new function f of z to be the sum of them uh, with coefficients which are cube, cube roots of unity. Uh, so uh, j, let's say, uh, well, tau is e to the power i to pi over 3. So this is the definition, and it turns out that uh, f, uh, so lemma says that, uh, so this function f is discrete holomorphic. Now, uh, what does it mean that the function is holomorphic? There are several definitions, and actually people now have forgotten that analytic function is the function whose, who has a power series expansion, the holomorphic function is the function whose, whose uh, contour integrals are zero. So we need to check that contour integrals are zero, which uh, if you pass to scaling limit and go from lattice to a plane would be equivalent to function being analytic. Uh, and uh, what are contour integrals on a lattice? Contour integrals on a lattice are just uh, contour sums on a lattice. And of course, like every contour integral, you can decompose into blocks. That's how the Marrera theorem has proved uh, uh, that analytic functions have zero contour integrals. Uh, so what, what you do, uh, I mean, any contour on a lattice can be decomposed into facets, just one by one. So the easiest one would be uh, that suppose we have a piece uh, of hexagonal lattice, and our function is defined at these three points. Let's say, well, z1, z0, z1, and z2. And the contour, the most primitive contour you can think of, or at least I can think of, is this triangle. And then, of course, you can add other triangles and everything will be composed of these contours. So you, you add these triangles and you integrate around them. So contour integral here, well, the sort of, uh, let's say, contour integral of f on this triangle, uh, or rather contour sum, is actually equal to, uh, so what is in, th in this case? It's, uh, mm, I f of zero, well, you we should put also mesh of lattice plus then this vector for f of z1 uh, plus this vector for f of z2. So actually, if you check, it will be I times sum of uh, a cube root of unity uh, f of zj. Because these four vectors are I, I um, times cube root of unity, I times another cube root of unity. So the question is whether this thing is equal to zero. So if we check that for every triangle, sum of f at these three vertices with such coefficients is equal to zero, uh, tau to the power j. Yes, sorry. So the, the coefficients would be here uh, uh, i, uh, here will be i tau, and here it will be i tau squared. So uh, if for every triangle this thing vanishes, we can take any contour, fill it with triangles. For each triangle it vanishes. When they stack together, they cancel out on the common boundary, and you get contour integral equal to zero. And uh, this is actually a very easy combinatorial exercise. So really easy, it's much easier than, well, for example, similar combinatorial exercise for the Ising model. Uh, so let's uh, uh, try to see what a configuration contri can contribute to this three numbers. So we have, uh, let me just maybe erase it and uh, write just uh, f of z0. Well, there is i times this f of z0 plus tau f of z1 plus tau squared f of z2. So this is, this is sort of contour integral of f. Now, uh, suppose I have a configuration where I had an interface which went like that and came to, the, uh, came to this point, and it started from point zero. And then the configuration also had many loops, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and somewhere there was this connection between points one and two far away. Uh, so we can play the railroad. We can extend this line by one step to the right or one step to the left. And essentially, what will happen that uh, 
Oh, it's time to start finishing the talk. Uh, yeah. No, it was actually time to go to the lecture on BA before yesterday. So, um, <laughs> uh, so if we extend it one step, one and two, zero, then what we get here, we get picture like this. What we get here is picture like that, if we extend to the left or to the right. And uh, essentially what we see here is that there is sort of a bijection or rather trijection between configurations and if there is this configuration which contributes one or rather one divided by two to the power area to f of z zero, we can extend it and it will contribute one to f of z one. Because so this configuration contributes one, well rather one to the power two to the power area to h zero of z zero. This contributes the same number to h0 of z1. This contributes, contributes the same number to h0 of z2. And if you take the same number and you contribute it here, here, and here, you sum with coefficients 1, tau, and tau squared, and you get 0. So basically, your equation is then 1 plus tau plus tau squared is equal to 0. Then there is another picture that assumes you arrived here and you met some loop. It's treated exactly the same. And there is one non-trivial case which has to be treated differently. And this non-trivial case is that uh, you go and go and go and you arrive not at a loop, but you arrive at this bridge between 1 and 2. So there is this bridge between 1 and 2, and you went and you arrived here. And now you can play a more interesting railroad game. So you really switch here the lines, and the lines connect, connect differently now. So we get this picture. And then you get this picture, 0, 1, 2. So what happens in this case is that the, you contribute here a number in the left, uh, let me write, to h, you contribute 1 over area to h0, but here you contribute 1 over area to h1. And here you contribute 1 over area to h2. And h1, h2, and uh, h0, they go into f with different coefficients. So essentially this means that you contribute uh, to f, you here contribute 1 over 2 to the power area to f. Here you contribute tau times 1 over 2 to the power area to f. And here you contribute uh, uh, 1 over 2 to the power area tau squared to f. So we have these contributions, then again you sum them with the coefficients tau and tau squared, but contributions are tau and tau squared themselves. And then you get 1 plus tau squared plus tau to the power 4. Again, it's equal to 0. So the lemma is proved. And now, essentially, what we have now, we have two lemmas. We have a function, which is discrete analytic, has discrete counter integral is 0. Uh, also, uh, we need to use a bit of this olden days percolation. And the olden days percolation says that uh, these functions, they will be uniformly holder independent of the mesh of the lattice. So they fo form a pre-compact family. You can choose a subsequence which converges. Uh, so what do we need from an analytic function to determine it? We need boundary values. And uh, now lemma three is about the boundary values. So lemma three, first you make an observation that uh, since sum of hj is identically equal to one and f of z is sum of tau to the power j h j of z. So this looks like barycentric coordinates. So it's, it's basically the usual thing. You have two coordinate vectors and you put some coefficients. But you can take three coordinate vectors, but you put coefficients which sum to one. So it's like this convex combination of vectors one tau and tau squared. Now what happens on the boundary? So let's have a look at the boundary. Let's say aj, aj plus 1. And suppose that z is here on the boundary. What are the possible, possible configurations here? Well, there is a configuration like that, which is hj plus 1. There is a configuration like this, which is called hj, so this with coefficient tau to the power 
j plus 1, this confusion with tau to that j. Now, can we have this picture? No, we cannot because two interfaces cannot intersect. So this is not allowed. So uh, hj minus 1 here on the boundary is identically equal to 0 on this part of the boundary. So on this arc, we get a convex combination of two vectors. So basically, lemma says that on arc hj, hj plus 1, the hj uh, uh, minus 1 identically equal to 0 which means that F is a convex combination of uh, uh, tau to the power j, tau to the power j plus 1, which means that essentially F belongs to this interval. And now we are ready in the remaining three minutes to finish the proof of a theorem. So the proof of a theorem. So send mesh of the lattice to zero. Choose converging subsequence where f uniformly converges omega to some function f small. So this we can do by uh, what Russell, Sam, Rovelsch and, and Keston have left to us that uh, there is some a priori bounds on how continuous percolation probabilities of percolation crossings are. So this is, this is the only part. So this is called uh, RSV lemma, the precompactness, compactness the same or well. So that's the only part which I don't do here. But since it was done in the 70s, it's sort of classical in every statistical mechanics book. Now, uh, uh, contour integrals of f are equal to zero, which means that f is holomorphic. Uh, on the boundary, f on the arc aj, aj plus 1, belongs to the interval from tau j to the power d j, tau to the power j plus 1. So it means that if we take our domain and our three points, it means that this arc, this arc is, well, the points are 0, 1, and 2, is sent to the interval from 1 to tau. Now, uh, this arc between 1 and 2, is set to the interval from tau to tau squared. And the arc from 2 to 0 is sent to this interval. Now you have an analytic function so that the three arcs are sent to these three intervals. So it means that it's exactly a map to, to an equilateral triangle. And that proves the Cardi formula because if I take z on the boundary, then I will get exactly what Carlson has, has predicted, QED. And my time is up. Mm -hmm.